video will explain the wide residual networks, otherwise known as wide resnets and then frequently abbreviated in papers as WRN dash the number of layers dash the widening factor. So the headline from this paper is that a si simple 16 layer wide resnet outperforms all previous resnet models, refer to this paper as thin resnets, and we'll explain what that means in the paper. So the wide resnet 22, 8, 22 being the number of layers and then 8 being the widening factor, outperforms the ResNet with over 1,000 layers by 1% on CIFAR 10 and 3.5% on CIFAR 100. And so they don't mention exactly uh, the training speed up on wide ResNet 22.8, but it's probably similar to, 20, uh, to uh, 44 because the widening factor has a similar computational bottleneck to the uh, plus 18 layers. But so they uh, add this note that the wide ResNet 44 with 40 layers widening factor of 4. And again, we're going to explain what widening factor means in this presentation. So that's eight times faster to train than the ResNet with a thousand layers. So these are some of the limitations of ResNets. ResNets introduce this skip connection where you take the layer at L minus one, the features from there, and then you just concatenate it ahead to the layer L features. So this really improved convolutional networks and it allowed for training for really deep networks. So AlexNet, probably something like eight convolutional layers, VGG ranges from 13 to 19 layers, and this uh, classic model of just stacking together convolutional blocks, if you, if you try to put like 30 or 50 layers of that, it'll start to perform terribly. But with the ResNet, it actually will continue to improve. But so what they find is that it's diminishing returns. If you try to scale up the ResNet from, say, 150 layers to 1,000 layers, you'll be like doubling your training time for very small performance gains. So what they're going to do is in this paper is they're going to take apart the ResNet blocks and they're going to widen it. So what they mean by widening it is they're going to increase the number of features. So the channel dimension is going to increase. So compared to this model right here, the basic wide is uh, wide because it has more feature maps. And so they're also going to compare that with the bottleneck layer in the ResNet. And then the and they're going to introduce this uh, dropout in the uh, in between convolutions and show how this improves performance as well. So, so yeah, they, uh, they show a lot of good results with this uh, dropout in between the convolutions. And they had previously uh, tried to put a dropout in between this identity mapping. If you remember, this identity mapping just copies the previous layer uh, activations and just kind of sends it ahead to the next layer. So they originally thought that maybe if they put some dropout here, it would be useful, but that doesn't get a good result. They find just putting it in this mapping is uh, successful. So in the classic ResNet, there are two kinds of blocks they use. The basic block, which is this 3x3 three three block, which each, each one is a convolution, bash normalization, and then ReLU activation. And then they also have this bottleneck, which they use to uh, shrink the features. It's sort of like an interesting heuristic. It I don't think it's well understood, but they go from the 1x1 one one convolution, which uh, pre preserves the spatial dimension. So like if you put in a 30x30, 30 feature map and then put it through a one by one convolution it'll come out 30 by 30 as well. So the wide ResNet, it just has a slight modification to this where it changes the order. So instead of convolution, batch normalization, ReLU, they're going to do batch normalization, ReLU, and convolution. And I wasn't really 100% sure why they did this, but they find a good result with it. So the idea is to increase the represent representational power of the ResNet blocks. And they can do this by adding more convolutional layers per block, widen the layers by adding more feature maps, they call it planes, and then they're going to increase the filter size, which is like that uh, kernel, like 3x3, three 5x5. Three, five five. So they're going to play with these two parameters, L and K, where L is the number of convolutions in a block, you know, like uh, how previously we saw L equals 2, where you have 3x3 three three and then 3x3 three three convolutions, but you might, yeah, maybe having 4 or 5 is useful, they're going to test that parameter. And then K is this widening factor, and that's the number of feature maps in the convolutional layers. So the number of parameters are going to increase linearly with L, but they're going to increase uh, quadratically with K. However, even though it increases quadratically with K, because you're adding more feature maps, this is like perfect for the GPU because you're distributing the same tensor from the previous activation across the uh, different feature maps. So the widening factor, even though it's a quadratic memory increase, it isn't quite as bad on the computational side. So this is the notation that they use to describe the wide ResNets. It's the WRN, NK, and you'll probably see this in other papers as well when they 
uh, you know, propose some new technique and then they give you like a table of different convolutional architectures that they compare the success of their technique across. So the n re refers to the layers, which is in this case 40, and then 2 is the widening factor. And that's just compared to the original ResNet and the wide ResNet. So 2 just means like double the feature maps of the original ResNet model. So this is the wide ResNet overall, the structure of the network, and it's these different uh, convolutions and convolutional blocks in which each one of these blocks represents this kind of structure. So again, the classic ResNet is thin on the, on the filter maps aren't that deep compared to this one where they have really wide, or like a lot of feature maps. So these are the, first they test uh, with these different types of convolutional structures. So rather, first they go three to three, uh, a three by three convolution, one by one to three by three, and all these different variants. But then when they test this, they don't really find uh, such a significant, if you see the performance is basically the same for each of these variants. So they just proceed ahead with the three by three convolutions. And then this is the L parameter saying how many uh, three by three convolutions should the intermediate features go through. And so they test with one, which performs worse. And then, so two and three, about the same. So they overall just decide to stick with two. So here is a more interesting table. This is where they have different depths and then different uh, widening factors for the wide ResNet. And they get the best results with a depth of 28 and then a widening factor of 10. So yeah, so this is a pretty interesting result. So then here is where they compare the wide ResNet with the original ResNet and then the uh, ResNet with the modified batch normalization ReLU convolution uh, like block structure rather than the other way around. And so you see how they outperform all the previous other methods. Even though they use more parameters, it takes less time to train because the like the uh, widening factor is easier to parallelize across the GPU. So it's easier to train faster, although it is more uh, memory heavy. So then they show the effectiveness of using dropout. And you can see that compared to the dropout counterparts, it's like a slight improvement in all cases. Uh, well, not even really in all cases. It's really like a really minor, definitely more pronounced in the CIFAR 100. But, I mean, they show it works. I don't think it's such a significant improvement, though. So thanks for watching this video on wide residual networks. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning paper summaries and videos.